Good morning. I will say at the outset that I don't do this for a living, that uh, I'm not a paid professional at this, so my best advice to all of you is to lower your expectations. Okay? This morning, uh, (laughs) we're going to be, we're back in the book of John. I guess we're going to be there for a long, long time. Um, this is, we're, we're still in John chapter 1, so I invite you, if you have your Bibles, if you would want to open them to John chapter 1, it seems like we've been in chapter 1 of John for quite some time, and uh, you're probably wondering, are we ever going to get to chapter 2? Well, I hope we do, but today we're going to finish off chapter 1 in the book of John, and I need my glasses, I can't see a thing up here. Anyway, because that's, uh, uh, before we get into the text today, I want to share with you some insights that I have gleaned over the years into the Gospel of John and really all of the Gospels, because I think it's helpful uh, to, to, to look at some things. Back in, back in my day, and by the way, my day goes back a long way. Uh, But back, it's a long time ago, when you went to college to study journalism, they used to call it J school, I don't know what they call it now, but if you were studying to be a newsman or a newswoman or a reporter of anything, if you were covering a story, they would teach you that there are four things that you had to get right before you could do anything else, four things, and they were four W's. It was who, what, when, and where. And once you got those things right, then you could deal with the how and the why. But you had to deal with, when if you're covering a story, you had to get those four things right. Who, what, where, and when. Who was involved? What actually happened? When did it happen? And where did it take place? That was Journalism 101. Now, if you listen to the news media today, it makes you wonder what are they teaching in, in J school today, but, but that's what they used to do. And many of you, I know, have, have taken Brian's challenge last year, and you've read the Bible all the way through, and I, and I applaud you for that. I, I know it's not an easy thing to do. I've done it several times, and it takes a lot of perseverance and a lot of just stick to itiveness. So it's a good thing. But, it's, but it can get, especially when you get to the Gospels, maybe some of you can identify with, you get to the Gospels and all of a sudden things can get a little confusing. I mean, because they don't necessarily fit together all that well. They don't tell a linear story of what happened when and to who and so forth and so on. So we're going to, they don't always mesh, and what I want to do today is kind of look at the who, what, when, and where, um, because as as Brian pointed out a few weeks ago, the first three Gospels are called the Synoptic Gospels, and and if you, and if you, uh, that, that word, if you break down that word, it makes a little bit more sense, because it's got the word optics. And the word optics basically means the way things look. And then if you put the pretext, the sin in front of it, that's S-Y-N, by the way. You put that, then that's where we get the word synergy or the word uh, sync, where things fit together. So you've got these three gospels that are called the synoptics that seem to fit together. Well, they've got their differences, but for the most part, they're very similar. And as John pointed out last week, our John, that John, not the John in the Bible or or John the Apostle. You know, I'd say his last name, but I always get it mixed up with Pertillo's over there. (laughs) And I I didn't want to mess that up. (laughs) Anyway, there's a lot of Johns involved here. Um, And the Synoptic Gospels, they have a few subtle differences between themselves, but they differ greatly from the Gospel of John. For example, if if you look at the who, what, and when, and where 
The synoptics will differ slightly in the who. In other words, how Jesus is referenced, how he's portrayed, because as John pointed out last week, they, they, they really had different target audiences. And I'll just go over that briefly again. In Mark's gospel, Mark is considered the, the earliest of the gospel, but he, he uh, focused his gospel on explaining the Jewish words and the customs to the Roman culture. And Jesus, throughout that gospel, is referenced as the Son of God. In Matthew's gospel, his audience was different. He, he spoke to the Jews, the Jewish nation. And he emphasized Jesus as the Son of David, or the Jewish Messiah, if you will. And then you get to Luke, and Luke's audience were the Greeks. And they, of course, Greeks were all, all big into philosophy. So he, he focused Jesus as the Savior. And these three came first. They came before John's gospel. So they were all in circulation before John wrote his. And uh, John's audience then was the world as a whole. He wanted to speak to everything. And in his gospel... Jesus is portrayed as the eternal Son of God, the Creator, the second member of the Trinity. The, he was one with the Father. He was God incarnate. So that's the who when it comes to the Gospels. And that's to the when in the synoptics, for example, the synop, in all the synoptic Gospels, they only mention one Passover. One Passover, that's all there is in there. So they tend to limit Jesus' ministry to only one year. But John's gospel takes us through three Passovers. And uh, so he encompasses three years or thereabouts of, of Jesus' ministry. The first Passover is in John chapter 2, verse 13. The second one is in chapter 6, verse 4. And the third one is uh, in chapter 12, verse 1. In fact, if you look at it and you read through, John, John's gospel covers most of the stuff in the other gospels in only one chapter, and that's chapter 6. So that's where John is. <coughs> now the rest of John's gospel then fills, kind of fills in all the blanks that are left out of the other gospels. And uh, so in the times and the places, the when and the where, if you will, all right? Now, as for the where, <laughs> in the synoptics, Jesus' ministry is located almost entirely in Galilee, in the region of Galilee. John, on the other hand, emphasizes Jesus in Judea, and he says very little about Galilee. So let's back up to the who for just a minute, because this is important. In the synoptics, Jesus' ministry, um, Jesus ministry kind of revolves around the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. That, that it's referred to as the kingdom of God in a couple of them, but in Matthew's gospel, he, he terms it the kingdom of heaven because he didn't want to use the word God because he was speaking to Jews, and they didn't want to say God's name. So he used the kingdom of heaven. But that's the emphasis in those three Gospels. In John, in his Gospel, he focuses on the person of Jesus, the individual person of Jesus. And his entire Gospel is built around seven I am statements that Jesus makes. There are seven I am statements. He says, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And I am the resurrection. Those seven I am statements is what John focuses on. He builds his whole gospel around that. By the way, those seven I am statements have a corresponding manifestation where God manifests himself to the children of Israel during the wilderness period. They're all in there. And those seven I am statements also correspond to the seven feasts of Israel. But that's for another time. And that phrase, I am, 
is a significant phrase to the Jewish people in the Old Testament. It's the divine name that was revealed to Moses at the burning bush. So it was significant to the Jews. And when Jesus uses this phrase, he's identifying himself with the God of the covenant, the creator, the provider, the protector, the savior. He says, I and the Father am one, and he who has seen me has seen the Father. And by, John, is also, John is also the only gospel that uses the miracles that Jesus performs as signs to point to who Jesus really is. They're not just the incredible acts and miracles that, 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 that are there to amaze people, to cure and to heal them so that they can get on board with the program. John uses them differently. They're not just a narrative of events. One after another, he gives light to the blind man. He gives bread to the 5,000. He resurrects Lazarus and Jairus' daughter and, and, the, and the boy on the funeral pyre. They're not, they're, they're not just miracles in John's gospel. They are manifestations of the second person of the Godhead, the divine in the flesh. And they define Jesus' station and his status as God incarnate. That's John's focus. And then lastly, John's gospel is the only one that records Jesus introducing the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the comforter, the helper. Now, one more thing might be a little helpful for you as you go through this book. If you break the book into sections it becomes a lot easier to get a handle around things, at least from the aspect of chronology, the when, all right? The first 11 chapters of John covers a period of about three years or thereabouts. Chapters 12 through 19 cover a period of six days. It's what we refer to as Holy Week. And then most of, chapter most of chapter 20 covers one day. And then chapter 21 takes place the days before his, after the resurrection and before his ascension. So that is helpful to me, and I hope it's helpful to you, uh, because for me it helps put this whole book in context, and it helps me to, to kind of integrate it with the other Gospels so that it all makes a little more sense. Anyway, it does for me, and I hope it does for you, too. All right, so now we got to get into what I really want to talk about today. Last week, John, our John, dealt with John the Baptist and the interrogation that he got from the scribes and the Pharisees as to who he was, and he answered them, if you remember, he answered them saying, well, I'm not the prophet, and I'm not Elijah, and I'm not the Christ, I'm not the Messiah, so this is where we're going to pick up the story. And as I read these verses, I want you to do something. I want you to pay attention to the who and the what and the when and the where. All right? So let's, uh, we're in John chapter 1. Let me begin in verse 25. And they asked him and said to him, why then are you baptizing? Again, they're talking to John the Baptist. If you're not the Christ, nor, the, nor Elijah, nor the prophet. And John answered them saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. Now make a point of that. He says, among you is one who you do not know. He's referring to Jesus. So Jesus is there when he's talking to these Pharisees. And he says, it is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. Now there's the where, all right? It's in Bethany. Now it's not the Bethany that's over by Jerusalem. It's, a, it's another Bethany, or actually it's Bethapara or something like that, they think. But it's on the, other, it's on the east side of the Jordan River. 
It's right at the top. Uh, uh, it's right at the top of where the Dead Sea was at that time. The Dead Sea shrunk quite a bit since then, but the Dead Sea was right there too. So he's on the other side of the Jordan River, the east side of the Jordan River. So that's the where. Then verse 29, it says, the next day. Now here we go. Now we're into the when. Notice it's the next day now. That, those verses before were one day. Now we're into day two. All right? He saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus was there that day. Now he's there this day. Okay? And this is he on behalf of whom I said, after, he, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. And I did not recognize him, but in order that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. And John bore witness, saying, I have beheld the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him, and I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Now, look at verse 30 and 31 again. It says, this is he on behalf of whom I said. In both of these verses, John is speaking in the past tense. He, as, he, as he relates to the accounts of the baptism of Jesus, he's speaking in the past tense. So this, as we're reading here, this is not the account of Jesus' baptism. That's already taken place. So when, when did this take place? Well, let me turn real quick to Mark's gospel. You don't have to turn there. I'll just turn there because I want to read from Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, because this gives us some indication. And it says, And it came about in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. All right? And immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens, thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. And immediately the spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. Notice that, verse 12. Immediately the spirit impelled Jesus to go out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beast, and the angels were ministering to him. So, <coughs> excuse me, back to John. When did this take place? This is not the account of Jesus' baptism. So when did this happen? Well, it had to be probably at least 40 days after his baptism because the, the Gospels tell us, and it's also in Matthew's Gospel, that Jesus went immediately into the wilderness. He didn't hang around. Now he's back. He's come back and he's there where John is and he's spending a few days here with John. Again, Verse 29, it says, the next day, that's day two, Jesus approaches John at the water site, and when he does, John says, this is the one. This is the guy. This is the one I've been telling you about, because I've been preaching about the Messiah all, these all this time. And this is the Son of God. This is the Lamb of God. This is the one that I saw the dove come down on. And I, saw, I heard the Holy Spirit, and I knew he was the one because I was told to look for the sign. And I saw it. And I heard the voice from heaven. And I knew it. Now, twice in this passage in John, twice John said, I didn't recognize him. Well, what's that all about? I mean, that seems a bit odd since John is Jesus' cousin. 
They've known each other probably for the last 25 years or so. They probably spent time together as, as a family during the required feasts in Jerusalem when, you know, Zechariah and Elizabeth, if you remember, they lived down there by Jerusalem. They were family. So when Joseph and Mary brought the family down to observe the feast, they probably got together. And they, they spent some time together. So John... When he says, I didn't recognize him, he's not saying that he didn't, know him as, he didn't know him as a person. He's saying, I didn't know him as the Messiah. Joseph and Mary, I mean, they knew of God's divine purpose for Jesus, but nobody else did. Maybe, maybe Elizabeth and Zechariah, but nobody else did. And even Jesus' own brothers had no regard for Jesus in, the, in that sense. In fact, they didn't believe he was anything special at all. I mean, they even mocked him. So until this sign appeared to John the Baptist at the baptism, he was in the dark. He knew Messiah was to come, but he didn't know it was Jesus. But now he does. And now he proclaims it. And I think this fact reinforces the true humanity of Jesus because he lived a normal human life up to this point. He wasn't, he wasn't like a Clark Kent who would change into a super God suit from time to time. Even though he, you know, he didn't sin, now I'll give you that. He didn't sin. He, he was different there. By, by, by the way, when I think about that, that must... It, that must have irritated the heck out of his brothers. You know? I mean, here's this, this kid never got in any trouble. And if you, if you had any siblings and you remember growing up with them, this kid, this kid was always good. Boy, that just would drive me crazy. And I, <laughs> I probably am going to get in trouble here, but I know, I know how this works, folks. Because I've been married to a woman for the last 50 years who has absolutely no vices. You know how hard that is? <laughs> Especially when you've got so many, as many vices as I have. It's tough. And it, it can get irritating at times. <laughs> but there was no reason to suspect that Jesus was the Messiah because he was fully human. And it's hard for us to understand that, but... But, but think of it this way. You and I are just like John the Baptist. We're just like him. We may know Jesus the man. We may accept him as a person of history. But it's not until the Holy Spirit comes upon us and quickens us and confirms to us that he's the Lamb of God that he's the Son of God, that he's our Messiah. It's not until the Holy Spirit gives us that revelation. Otherwise, he's just a man. And it's only then that you and I can bear witness as John bore witness and say to others, behold. And by the way, that word behold is my favorite word in all the Bible. Because all it means is, look. Look here. Behold, look here. Let me introduce you to the one who will take away your sin. We can't say that until we know. Like John knew. This is what John does, and this is what we do. We reclaim Jesus as that way. Okay, back to the, back to the scripture. Verse 35. Again the next day. Notice that. That's the way it starts. This is day three now. The next day, John was standing with his two disciples, and he looked upon Jesus as he walked. Okay, there's Jesus again. He's there in day three. He was there in day one, two, and now it's day three. And he looked upon Jesus as he walked, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. That's the way. I want you to notice how John describes Jesus to his disciples. 
This is important. He says, behold, look, there's the Lamb of God. Now, where did that come from? Where did John come by that? Where did he get it? You, if you remember, and you have all know this, most Jews believed that the Messiah would come as some kind of a deliverer. Some, he would be it, like Moses or like David. Most believed he would come as a conqueror to throw off the, the Roman oppressors and to reestablish the throne of David and to, and to restore the glory of Israel. That's what they thought Messiah was going to do. A, a king who would come and reestablish their freedom and their prosperity to defeat their enemies and to once again elevate Israel to greatness. And this Messiah... He would come, he he would be a man, by the way, just a man, because the Jews always spoke of the Messiah as the Lord's Messiah. He would not be God incarnate because God was one. And to the Jews, there is no Trinity. There is no Trinity. He would be just a man like Moses. But he would, he would walk in God's power, and God's power would be upon him, and he would do wondrous and marvelous things. So coming as a lamb to be sacrificed, that was non sequitur. That was an anathema to what they believed. It wasn't even a consideration for most Jews. So for John, John the Baptist, Where did this come from? Where did he get that? When did this revelation come to him? This this Lamb of God business. Well, the answer to that is simply we don't know. We don't know when it came to him. We, you know, some think it was the Holy Spirit impressed this upon John at Jesus' baptism. Well, maybe it happened then, maybe it didn't. I don't know. The other possibility is that it was here in John chapter 1 when Jesus returned from the wilderness and he came to John. And remember, he's been there now for three days and maybe he took John to the side. He spent a few days there and and talked to him and maybe at some point he sat down with John and he told him what his real mission was. Maybe that's when it happened. We don't know. But somewhere, Somewhere along the line, John gains the understanding that Jesus did not come as a conquering hero, but as a sacrificial lamb. Like the Passover lamb that they all knew about that took place back in Egypt, where God took the lamb and took the blood and spread it on the, blood, uh, the doorpost so that the angel of death would pass over them. And by the way, they've been celebrating that and remembering that for the past 1,400 or so years, every year. And Jesus was not the kind of Messiah they were expecting. He didn't come to change their physical circumstance. He came to change their spiritual status before God. And they didn't get it. They just didn't get it. In verse 35 through 37, John the Baptist then begins to share the fruits of his own ministry, or excuse me, shed the, the fruits of his own ministry because he'd been out there preaching and proclaiming that Messiah is coming. And now he says to his followers, there he is. That's him. You need to leave me behind now, and you need to follow him. And they did. And as you read through the rest of the chapter, we see Jesus calling his first disciples. There is, there is John the apostle who wrote this book, who's probably one of them, and then Andrew, and then Peter, and then Philip, and Nathaniel. And in verse 38, this, one's, this one jumps out at me. They, they, they followed Jesus. In verse 37, the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and beheld them following. And, in, and then he said to them, and this is in red, 
What do you seek? What do you seek? That's an interesting question. I mean, he asked them, boys, what are you looking for? What, what are you looking for? And they're probably thinking, well, well, John said you're the Messiah. He said, we should follow you. And, you know, we've heard that the Messiah is coming. John's been telling this, and he's going to liberate God's people. And, and we want to be a part of that. I could see them thinking that. I'd be thinking that. You see, I don't, I don't, I don't think they really got this Lamb of God business. In fact, if you read the rest of the story, none of the disciples really actually got it until after it was over, after Jesus' death and his resurrection. That's when they finally figured it out, until the death. So this question that Jesus asks, what are you looking for? What kind of Messiah are you seeking? You know, I believe that question is as pertinent for us today as Christians as it was back then. And I'll admit it's true of me as it is of everybody else. Could it be that everything is different today, but nothing's changed? And everything's changed, but nothing's different? <laughs> you know, isn't our thinking as Christians, and I'm, I'm going to step on some toes here, isn't our thinking as Christian focused on the victory and overcoming? And we really don't think in terms of a pathway of sacrifice. We don't think that way, do we? We sing songs like victory in Jesus and onward Christian soldiers and all that. We want the victory without the struggle. Aren't we just like the Jews? You know, I think, aren't we, we want a Messiah that's going to change our circumstances, don't we? We want a Messiah that are going to just make things right, that's going to come into our lives and make things right. You think I'm wrong there? <clears throat> well, let me ask you this. What's your prayer life like? What do you pray for? Don't we pray for Jesus to come and to fix things? Isn't that what we usually do? We want him to come and fix things, to save us from the difficulties of life, to deal with our health and our finances and our, all our relationship issues. Jesus, come in here and fix this stuff. Save me, Lord, for the crappy parts of life. Come and fix whatever's wrong. Isn't that how we pray? It is how I pray most of the time. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that because Jesus does those things and he still does those things. So there's not anything wrong with that. But I think it's an indication of the kind of Messiah that we want, that we would prefer. That's what the Jews wanted. I mean, are we missing the point like they did? Jesus didn't come to change their world. He came to change them. And he does the same for you and for me. You know, John the Baptist, not this John, John the Baptist does not point to Jesus and say, look there, there's the King of Kings. There's the Lord of Lords. There is the glory of heaven. There, hey, look, it's Mr. Miracle Man who will change everything for you. He'll fix everything for you. He doesn't say that. Now he says, this is the Lamb of God who will take away your sin. You know, people followed Jesus around for a lot of different reasons back in those days. They were looking for all kinds of different things. And people still do today. 
You know, when we follow Jesus, we're all looking for something, aren't we? We're all following him for whatever reason appeals that appeals to us. In those days, they gave him all kinds of names and all kinds of titles. Some of them were good, some of them were bad. And we do the same thing today. But John the Baptist nails it. He gives him the one title that is the most important of all. The most important for you and the most important for me. And you know, folks, I can stand up here and I can tell you how good God has been to me and how good he is and how all the wonderful things that he's done for my family over the years. I can stand up here and bear witness to all of that. The many blessings that we have enjoyed and the wisdom and the understanding that he's poured into me, I can tell you all of those things, how God has prospered us. But the one reality, the one reality that supersedes all of that is that Jesus chose to sacrifice himself for me. Everything else pales in comparison to that. Everything else that Jesus has been for me shrinks into insignificance because he died so that I could live. He was God's lamb for me. Excuse me, I got allergies. He was God's lamb for me. And he is for you too. So when I think about that question that John asked those two disciples, or what Jesus, excuse me, that Jesus asked those two disciples, what are you looking for? What kind of, what kind of Jesus do you want? I guess we could put that question to ourselves too. What are you looking for? What kind of Messiah do you want? And when I think about that, I think about that question. And I realize that the greatest thing Jesus could ever do for me, he's already done it. He's already done it. And he's done it for you too. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, where do we begin? <clears throat> when we come to you and we seek to follow you, where do we begin? Our gratitude has no beginning and it really has no end. Our praise for you has no beginning and it has no end. You are the one that we've been looking for. You are the one who chose to be the lamb for each of us. And so, Lord God, we thank you. We praise you without end. Lord, be our Savior. Send your Spirit that we might know. We might know that we know. In your name, Lord, we pray.